Our speaker today is an integral part of Trinity by the Coles family. Growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, her youth was steeped in music, both sacred and secular. Her love of singing and also both the piano and organ and playing both the piano and the organ led her to attain a bachelor's and a master's in, uh, degree in music. Her next step and challenge was law school. Graduating with a degree from Creighton University School of Law, soaring into her legal career. First in corporate franchising, followed by being appointed as assistant dean of the law school of Creighton University. The path also led her to become the assistant to the president of the university. <laughs> then the State Department called. During the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, where she accepted a position as the U.S. Agency for International Development as Project Director for Eastern Europe Programs, then as Director of Policy for the agency. With the change of administrations, she followed her legal interest in franchising and accepted a position as Director of Research and Education for the International Franchise Association in Washington, D.C. In 2005, she was an IMF major award winner, and that's the International Franchise Association. But today, Catherine is our awarded speaker. <clears throat> Family connections in Naples like Catherine and Tom to purchase a home, but also to find a perfectly suited church for them, Trinity by the Cove, with its beauty and music and liturgy. Both Catherine and Tom are major supporters of Trinity's music program, and currently Catherine is the chair of the organ committee. A good choice by Edward. <laughs> Both are active as lectors and attend formation and scripture classes. Catherine taught the Thursday evening's Advent Formation Series. Her style of presentation led her to us. Our daughter's chapter members unanimously requested that Catherine Morgan lead us in our Lenten journey today, and she graciously accepted. Please join me in welcoming Catherine as our Lenten Quiet Day speaker. We're just working out the technology. <laughs> We're mining her up so she doesn't strain her voice. There we go. <clears throat> And I'll adjust the slides. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What an honor to be here. Uh, this is a beautiful time and a beautiful subject. Uh, I think you had uh, an introduction in the adjacent room. I would just like to point out that I think each of you has a program mm -hmm. that has, I see them on your lap. In the program, you have a couple blank pages for taking notes, if you wish. And obviously, there's a schedule of the day. Uh, I think Mother Marcella is going to ring the tolling bell <laughs> when it will be time to start each uh, new session. We'll break the morning in three parts. Each part will have a spoken presentation, followed with meditation time for you, uh, where you can walk anywhere, sit anywhere, and ponder what we're talking about. We'll be focusing today on the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, and the underlying theme, the grace of forgiveness. Grace and forgiveness are two somewhat nebulous concepts. We could all agree that we want as much as we can get of both. But what are they? 
and we're going to use them extensively this morning. So I want us to agree on what the definition of these two terms would be. Grace has been defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Those words are really significant. Grace is unmerited. You can't go buy it. You don't earn it. It is from the divine source, from the Lord. It is assistance, but it's assistance with a focus. The focus is, it's given to us humans, it's not given to animals, for our regeneration or sanctification. Those are significant terms that will apply to us, and we will use them as we study how they apply to the characters in our painting. Forgiveness. What is forgiveness? We want it. We pray for it. I hope we give it to those around us who ask for it. Forgiveness is a decision. It's a decision to let go of resentment and anger and the need for retaliation when something has been done to you. Retaliation is what is instinctive. If you look at little children and, some, and one little boy kicks another little boy, what does he want to do? He wants to kick back. If one two-year-old bites another two-year-old, <laughs> what do they want to do? And all us mothers have lived there. So the, the forgiveness is a decision not to retaliate. Not to retaliate. Maybe it's even with a cutting word. But in any event, that's where we start right now. And we all know what decision, what the decision of forgiveness feels like. We know when we need to forgive others. And we know when we want to be forgiven and to be enveloped in the Father's arms, just as in the painting. In our lifetime, <clears throat> One of the extraordinary examples that we have all seen of forgiveness took place in South Africa. After the end of apartheid, the question was, what is going to happen? Because the ending country could have simply been torn about uh, totally into chaos. Archbishop Desmond Tutu became the head of the Commission on uh, Forgiveness. And in the book called The Book of Forgiving, which is just a gem, Desmond Tutu has this to say about forgiveness. First of all, you can have two kinds of forgiveness. You can have the kind that we probably see most with children. I'll forgive you only if you say you're sorry. <laughs> That's a conditional forgiveness. I'll forgive you only if you pay me back. We're talking about unconditional forgiveness when we look at something like that painting. What Bishop Tutu says is this. Unconditional forgiveness is a different model of forgiveness than the forgiveness with a string. This is forgiveness as a grace. Grace, ah, grace is unmerited divine assistance. This is forgiveness as a grace, a free gift, freely given. <coughs> In this model, forgiveness frees the person who inflicted the harm the harm from the weight of the victim's whim, what the victim may demand in order to grant forgiveness, and it frees it from the victim's threat of vengeance. It also frees the one who forgives 
the one who offers forgiveness as a grace, is immediately untethered from the yoke that bound him or her to the person who hurt him. When you forgive, you are free to move on in life, to grow, to no longer be a victim. When you forgive, you slip the yoke and your future is unshackled from your past. The Book of Forgiving. We'll be back to it in a little while. <clears throat> the return of the prodigal son that you see here and have seen on your programs is an absolutely overwhelming painting uh, by Rembrandt. It hangs in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. It's about eight feet high and six feet wide. Wow. When you come upon it in that museum, it's extraordinary. Suddenly, you know, the group of people, the, the tourists and whatnot, who've been wandering through that gallery, they come in front of this painting and they're struck dumb. Sir Kenneth Clark, some of you may remember seeing his Civilization series mm -hmm. on television uh, a year or two ago. Uh, <laughs> Sir Kenneth Clark, a great art critic, says that for those who have seen this painting, they may feel is that it is the extraordinary painting of our time. We will use it this morning to study the people in the painting. And you see three main characters here. Your program has a picture right on the front of it, obviously, of the father and the prodigal son. We're used to seeing those two. Standing a little at a distance is the older son. In the middle, in the back, now, Rembrandt didn't tell us this, but we think we have the Pharisee who is looking at this because this whole parable came about because the Pharisees were muttering. And let's take a look at what the Pharisees said. If you happen to have your Bible, it's Luke chapter 15. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, dear, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Now eating with them was a big deal then. Uh, what you ate and whom you ate it with was all set out in the law. Uh, in a large uh, estate like the one we're gonna talk about, the men would eat separately from the women and the children, and certainly there were no Gentiles there. So the accusation that Jesus would have been eating with sinners was not a good one. So what did Jesus do? He heard them muttering. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus told them this parable. And the reason I emphasize that is the rest of this chapter, and it all fits on a single page in, in your Bibles. The rest of this chapter gives us three stories. But the fact that Jesus regards it as one means we're going to come back to these first two small ones later. The first story is the story of the Good Shepherd. And that's very simple. Single sheep gets lost. The Good Shepherd goes out hunting for it. The good shepherd finds it, puts it on his shoulders, and carries it home. Then what does he do? He calls his friends for a party. So we have the loss, and the loss of the sheep is kind of accidental. But the good shepherd, who obviously is Jesus, is going to go looking, find it, carry it home. I love the physical contact here. And then have a party. Short story, second short story. Remember, this is all part of the same parable. Second story is 
the parable of the lost coin. You remember this one. The woman lost a coin. And what did she do? She swept the house. She tried everything she could do to find it. She found it. And then what did she do? She called everybody to have a party and celebrate. That's the second story. And now we get to the third story. And remember, Jesus is telling this story to the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the sinners and whoever is there. And this well-dressed man in the middle, probably a Pharisee, is listening to all this. And here comes the story. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. And now all these people in the middle say, we know this story. This is from Genesis. This is the story of Isaac and Rebekah and their twin sons. Remember, they had two sons and the younger wanted the older's inheritance. So in this case, the mother helps because the father is basically blind, helps put hair on the arms of the younger so the father will assume that this is the older and then give the blessing or inheritance that belongs to the older to the younger. So the people listening to this story of there was a man who had two sons think we know this story, but they don't. Jesus continued. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now I know you're hungry for what happens next, but I'm going to stop you for a minute to remind you of several things. This is a parable. I see many familiar faces here. And we talked some in the Advent period about Mary and Joseph and their son and the things that happened in that time. I said then that Mary and Joseph are like your great, 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 great grandparents. You didn't know them, but you knew they were real and you had family stories about them. So we knew where they lived and kind of what they did and what their inheritance was. This is not that kind of biblical story. This is a story. This is a parable. And a parable is a narrative story Jesus used extensively in his teaching. It's a story that has a moral. So it's truth or reality is its moral. And usually it has one moral. But this particular story that will follow, the story of the prodigal son, really, you may conclude, has several morals. It is as sophisticated and <coughs> complex a parable as we find. Now, most parables are stripped down. That is, they eliminate all the details we don't need to know. We don't know how old those two sons were. We don't know what their names were. We don't know if they went to school or if they were good or bad students or whatever. What we end up knowing though, is that stripped down, the younger wants what he shouldn't have yet. Now that's a parable. But as we look at the parable, we automatically put it into our time. Really, when we go to church, that's what we're doing in all kinds of our sermons or our scripture studies. We're taking the lessons and, and the events that happened and we're putting it into our time. To understand what happens here though, you really have to go back to Jesus' time, the time that this story was being told, because it is really quite different in his time, the events that happened there, from what it would be in our time. What we have here is the fact that the younger son, the scripture says, 
has gone to his father and asked for his inheritance. Father, give me my share of the estate. What does the father do? Looks simple to us. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, which for us who might have any uh, legal background, the equivalent of that is he liquidated his holdings so he had it all in money. He got together all that he had and he set off for the distant country and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. This is an extraordinary series of events in a very small period of time. But we're listening to it with 21st century ears. We're thinking, so the younger son asked for his inheritance. Almost all of us know people who asked their parents for what amounts to an advance on their estate. We don't think of it that way now, but that's what it is. The child comes to you and says, I see this really big opportunity. It's just great. I want to buy this franchise over there. New franchise company going to make a million. But I need your help in the initial franchise fee. I need to borrow the franchise fee and the initial capital required to run the business for the first year. And if the parent goes into the retirement account, the retirement account, exactly the same as the estate. So we think to ourselves, because we've seen this happen, oh yeah, there are ways to deal with this. You get a good estate lawyer, you, you uh, allow for the advance on the estate, you're gonna balance things out at the end so that the other kids get what they need. In a sense, we think this is no big deal. For that time, wrong. This is a huge deal. The parent really was restricted in how his estate was going to be divided because he couldn't use a will. Because the law set out for him how this estate was going to be divided. And the estate would be divided this way, which just complicates your story. A younger son gets one third and the older son gets two thirds. And you think, gee, that's not very equal. <laughs> Except the two thirds comes with a little bit of a string. With the two thirds, the older son must, for the duration of her life, care for his mother and for any unmarried sisters. And the older son will continue to manage the farm the estate. Because what we're dealing with in this particular story, we know from what happens later, this is not a little bit of a plot behind a family small house. This is an estate. We know this because the older son is far away and doesn't hear what's going on at all. He's working in the fields. And there are servants who have been following people around. There are even three different kinds of servants, and we'll find out about those in a minute. So what we have here is a situation where the younger son has said to his father, by the way, this division of property, the one third, two thirds, that happens when the father dies, not before, not before. And what the younger son has asked for is not only that the division, and the division, it's, it's not just one third, two thirds. I mean, the father could say, you, younger kid, I don't think you're very good with the animals. So I'm gonna give you the farm fields. And I'm gonna give the orchards and the flocks of animals and whatnot. The other two thirds will go to the older son. He could divide things that way for future distribution but nothing would be sold during the father's life. Because, and the final restriction is this, right up to the time that the father dies, the income from that whole thing, it's called the usufruct, it, re, it 
keeps coming back to the father who is distributing it to everyone who's working on the farm. It's supporting the father and the mother. It's supporting the salaries for all the workers. It's supporting what's needed to just manage the farm and the animals and whatever. It may even be increasing the size of the overall estate. But in any event, the whole thing is coming to support the entity. Now, what the young son has asked for is, the division, tell me which I'm going to get, and you must sell it. And that takes some real doing. Because the whole community knows you don't sell this while the father is still alive. Because you're not only selling the farm, you're giving up the use of it. In other words, you're giving up the income. You're giving up a third of the income. <coughs> So, Dad, I want a third of it, and I want you to sell it and give me the money. Yeah. And oh, by the way, the impact of this is going to be to reduce your income uh, by a third for as long as you live. It's astounding. This does not happen in the time uh, in Israel at the time that Jesus was living. So what is simply blowing away, amazing, is the scripture says, the father did it. Now, this wouldn't have happened there. So what Jesus is doing is setting up a new model of a father for us. So he has this man who has two sons and his name is father. But he's not a typical oriental patriarch. We have a new model of a compassionate father. Now, what would have happened? It's fascinating. What would have happened in real life? Uh, in Jesus' time, in real life, if the younger son had done this. And now I'm going to, to quote from one of a series of four lectures by Dr. Kenneth Bailey. I would really encourage you to go on the internet and listen to these. Kenneth Bailey was uh, ultimately the theologian for the uh, Episcopal Church in, in one of the dioceses in, in Pennsylvania, but he started out as a uh, New Testament scholar, New Testament and Old, Old Testament, in the Middle East, teaching in seminaries there. Taught there for 40 years in Christian seminaries. Points out to us that, yes, there are Christians in the Middle East. He said there are 15 million Christians in the Middle East that we don't think about. All right, so he is teaching out there. And you can look up these four sermons all about the prodigal son. And they're wonderful. You can listen on the internet. Okay, what's one of the things he says would have happened? Ken Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y. So what would have happened then in real life if the younger son had gone and asked? This is what he said. In the story of the prodigal son, as far as we know, the father is in good health and he's still managing the farm. He is supposed to tell the, the son, little boy, get out of here. <laughs> if he's an oriental patriarch, he's going to take the back of his hand and he's going to strike the kid across the face and he's going to drive him out of the house. Now that was at that time. Admittedly, we find it striking. Uh, we, we don't like the thought that a parent would strike a child. But then Dr. Bailey goes on. And because he had taught over there in seminaries for 40 years, he says, what would happen now if a younger son went to his father and said he wanted the estate? And this is what he said. I had a student, I, Dr. Bailey, who after some years told me that this had happened in his family. 
One of his brothers had asked his father for the inheritance. I, Dr. Bailey, said to the student, you know, Ed, what happened? And he said, well, my father hit him across the face, <laughs> drove him out of the house. <clears throat> and then he said, we, the other brothers, worked to try and get my brother and my father into the same room so we could talk about it. How long did that take, I asked. Five years, the student replied, <laughs> before the father was even willing to be in the same room with the brother who had asked for his inheritance. So we may be assuming that this was not that big a deal, but in that culture, it's a big deal. This is by Tissot and it's entitled The Departure of the Prodigal Son. Tissot was a French painter <clears throat> uh, in the 19th century who had a, uh, some sort of a religious experience, after which he only painted things from the New Testament. He did a series on the prodigal son. So this is the way he pictured a young man coming to his father. This one is in London. He pictures the father <clears throat> running a, a seafaring business <clears throat> on, on the Thames. And you can see through the, the windows there, uh, some of the rigging and whatnot from ships in the background. So supposedly now, this is a much more calm, <clears throat> rational conversation. In this painting, he puts the older brother, and the older brother is over on the left, and he figures that the older brother is probably married. So he includes in all his paintings, the older brother and the wife. The older brother is looking out the window as if to say, what? <laughs> what? <clears throat> so we're gonna have to do all the work then in this business and you're taking assets, what? <laughs> but the father is looking kindly. It's as if now, today, this would go ahead and be fine. And you, what you do not get is the impact on the village itself. So the young son gets the money. Now it's interesting, nothing here, thank you, says, that the young son was asking for the money to go start a business or buy a house. We don't have that at all. The implication is very clearly the young son wants the money to go to Las Vegas <laughs> or whatever the Las Vegas equivalent is. And in this case, Tissot thinks the Las Vegas equivalent is what at that time was a fascination with Japan. So he sends him to Yokohama to a geisha house. And we have there the young son on the floor, and there are geishas leaning up against him and dancing in front of him. He's having a great time. Now, if you change the country you're in, we'll go back to Rembrandt. And Rembrandt's painting here is entitled The Prodigal in the Brothel. <laughs> And we have the young man having a great time. <laughs> now, I'll give you a little background here. This is not scripture, but really, that's a self-portrait of Rembrandt at about that age. <laughs> Maybe, and I can't even say Rembrandt is picturing himself in the brothel because the woman there is his wife, <laughs> whom he loved dearly. But in any event, the painting is entitled the prodigal son in the brothel. <laughs> now, what happens? Well, the scripture says, incredibly succinctly, he lost all his money. And it's done in so few words, we almost can't comprehend what's involved here. Henry Nowen, I'm sure that you have heard the name of Henry Nowen. He's written a wonderful book. 
called the return of the prodigal son. Henry Nouwen says about all this, the son's leaving, taking the money, is a much more offensive act than it seems at first reading. It is a heartless rejection of the home in which the son was born and nurtured, and a break with the most precious tradition carefully upheld by the larger community of which he was a part. When Luke writes and left for a distant country, he indicates much more than the desire of a young man to see more of the world. He speaks about a drastic cutting loose from the way of living, thinking, and acting that has been handed down to him from generation to generation as a sacred legacy. More than disrespect, it is a betrayal of the treasured values of family and community. The distant country is the world in which everything considered holy at home is disregarded. So he's over there and he's lost everything. He's lost everything. And we're told that about that time, a famine came along. So it sounds like the equivalent of our uh, depression. A depression came along. So there's no money and he can't get a job, except he takes a job for a Gentile feeding pigs. Feeding pigs. This is a painting by Reuben of the prodigal and the pigs. So what the prodigal has done, if the insults to his family were not enough, he has also lost the money to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. It was one of the two most unforgivable sins at that time. So he lost the family estate to the Gentiles. And now, in case you wanted to put some frosting on the sin, he goes to work for the Gentiles feeding pigs. It's as if, remember when we started this whole thing, it's because the Pharisees were muttering, oh, Jesus is with the sinners. And he's even eating with them. And we're finding, in effect, Jesus saying, yep, wait till you see the sinners I love. <laughs> Here's one where I'm going to paint for you sin that you can't imagine. And just in case you couldn't imagine it worse than the brothel and the gambling and all the rest, now I'll give you an ultimate sin. He's going to work for the Gentiles with the pigs. <laughs> So this is the time when what Luke says happens is that the prodigal comes to himself. If you have a description, now in your program, the program itself, uh, Mother Marcella has printed out the text of the prodigal son from Luke 15. Uh, you can look at the beginning verses that we've talked about so far as you walk around and think about things. And we will pick it up from here. Uh. I don't happen to have the text. I've got it on a table up front. And uh, when the bell rings, that's when you are called back. What time are we coming back? Uh, the bell rings. The bell rings. Uh, the bell rings. Uh, the bell rings. Uh, 